in these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing, and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Good afternoon or morning or evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I'm Kadir van Lohuis, uh, I'm your host, uh, and today we are having the fifth edition of Emerging Stories. Uh, so you can uh, log in on Zoom or you can uh, go to the website of Parkhuis de Zwijger, which is dezwijger.nl, and you can uh, chat uh, with other viewers and you can ask your questions to the guests which I will introduce now. Um, very happy today to have uh, in the studio, we have uh, Vladimir van Wilgeburg, who's actually living in Kurdistan, but at the moment is in the Netherlands. He will explain us why. Um, we have uh, Gilda Horvat, who's uh, uh, in Vienna, and she's a Roma journalist and activist, I think. Uh, she will speak about uh, uh, the Roma communities in uh, Eastern Europe. And then we have Shahidul Alam from Dhaka. Uh, good evening to you, Shahidul. Uh, a journalist, photographer, writer, activist, and uh, he will take us uh, into the situation of what's currently happening in Bangladesh. So uh, welcome to you all, and uh, let's get rolling. We start with uh, Vladimir. Um, uh, thank you for being here, Vladimir. This is not really where you're supposed to be, right? Yeah, normally I, I live in Erbil in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, but I basically got stuck here and uh, just uh, like everybody else, there's no more flights, so it's difficult to go back. I mean, there's flights for people with Iraqi citizenship, but for foreigners in general, the Iraqi and the Kurdish government, they want to also stop the spread of the virus. So that's why I'm still in the Netherlands and waiting till the situation improves with the with the flights. So, so when you're normally when you're in Arbil, which is the the capital of uh, the Kurdistan it, region, yeah, yeah, the Kurdistan region. Uh, what what what's your work? What what are you doing there? Well, I mean, um, I uh, write for a Kurdish website called uh, Kurdistan Twenty Four in uh, in English. So I write stories about. Um, yeah, let's say the Kurdish issue. Um, I write stories about the, the conflicts. I mean, before I was especially covering a lot the war against ISIS uh, during the height of the crisis when uh, Mosul was still occupied by ISIS. I also sometimes go to Syria, northeastern Syria, where also the Kurds, they have their own uh, autonomous uh, system. So I have been covering ba basically mostly these issues. And then, of course, you have the conflicts between the Kurds and Iran and between the Kurds and Turkey. Uh, problems Wh with like that and Erbil, uh, and this is this is in Syria where they are now also dealing with the coronavirus uh, crisis. So they have implemented uh, curfews. Um, there is no more way to to go to Syria for for foreigners or or Syrians because the borders they also close them to prevent the virus from spreading. Uh, but until now they don't have so much coronavirus cases. I think they have around two or three cases and one death. So oh, uh, and this is where. What? This is in, in northeastern Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, and also in the Kurdistan region, they have so far only five deaths and, and uh, a number of uh, coronavirus cases. But it hasn't affected that much as I expected, because you have in Iran, you have like a lot of cases, like there's a lot of deaths, hundreds of deaths. And Iran is ne next to Iraq, next to the Kurdistan region. But so far, both Syria and Iraq, they were not so much affected as I expected. And, and do you know why? I mean, are, are the, or are the numbers reliable? Well, I mean, it's difficult to say because, I mean, there's not a nationwide testing system. I mean, they mm. lack tests. Uh, I mean, in, in northern Syria, for instance, they just recently had the ability to test because uh, they got uh, uh, PCM uh, machines to test people for the virus. But before, they didn't have any ability to test anyone. So they were just doing, like, temperature checks or uh, uh, other tests. But... Um, yeah, so far, it's it's very unclear why uh, so far the virus haven't hit Syria and Iraq so hard. Uh, but of course, it, I mean, it's just the beginning. Like now there's, for instance, two, two to three cases in, in northeastern Syria, and there have been other cases in the rest of Syria. 
So we don't know because there are so many refugee camps, people displaced, vulnerable people. Uh, the health situation is very bad in Syria. I mean, they have been in this... But, but just to take people a little bit into the situation, right? Yeah. Because it's rather complicated. We have, yeah. we have Syria in itself, obviously. Yeah. Then we have the Turkish... Who, who the Turks who are operating in the, in the border area yeah. uh, where, where and, and preventing Syrians to flee into uh, into Turkey. Yeah. So then a lot of people still in the camps there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you have like, if you could define Syria, you basically have sort of three areas. You have areas controlled by, by Turkey, and then you have uh, the areas under the Syrian regime, and then you have the area uh, controlled by the Kurdish-led forces. So in Idlib, in northwestern Syria, you have thousands of Syrians that fled from regime, uh, regime offenses or, or, or attacks because they were fighting between the rebels and the regime. There's like thousands of refugees in camps in, in Idlib, and they're basically stuck there. They cannot also go to Turkey. Uh, and from time to time, there's also fighting between the rebels and the regime. And it's still, the fighting is still going on, or did, did it diminish because well, of this? Well, there was a ceasefire uh, um, by, uh, implemented by the Russians and Turkey uh, to prevent fighting. There was heavy fighting uh, months ago. Uh, so, so far, there, there has been no major fighting, but still from time to time, there is some like uh, explosions, uh, drone attacks or, or small fighting going on. And is this connected to the crisis or is this because the agreement of the ceasefire was there already? Yeah, well, the, the ceasefire agreement was already there before uh, before the situation. So, uh, I mean, but that doesn't mean it's sort of a semi-frozen conflict where you sometimes have bomb attacks, sometimes fighting breaks out again. And you have the same situation with, let's say, the Kurdish-controlled areas because in October, Turkey did a major offensive and captured two small cities. And after that, there was also a ceasefire uh, by Turkey and America and between Turkey and the Russians. So then the conflict stopped again and and turkey already attacked the kurds i think around three times uh but there's always a, a chance that there would be a renewed conflict between turkey and the kurdish-led forces in northeastern syria and it's the same in northwestern syria with the regime and and the syrian rebels uh, so there's like that's why syria is so complicated because you have all these different actors that have influence in syria because if if you have to look ahead you know i mean uh is, is there actually a lockdown or what what, what? What does it mean? Well, I mean, I mean, in, in uh, all, all these three, three, let's say, three areas in Syria, which are controlled by different action, uh, factor, fac factions, they have their own lockdown measures. But I know the most about northeastern Syria. And northeastern Syria, they have a curfew. Uh, they do tests. So, for instance, people uh, from rebel-held areas or regime-held areas, they cannot just easily go into northeastern Syria. So, for instance, there are still flights between uh, Damascus, the capital, and Kamishli, which is under uh, where it's in the northeast of Syria. So, for instance, when people coming from um, from Damascus to Kamishli, they are going; they have to go on quarantine. So, they also implement quarantine. Uh, basically, de facto, everyone has their own system. So, you have like basically all different administrations inside Syria with their own coronavirus measures. Yeah. So, if 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 you have to look ahead uh, in in the coming months or or into next year, will will this this whole crisis? Do, do you believe it will have an effect on uh, on on uh, on the conflict or a possible peace process? Well, I do think it has. Like until now, I think still the the, the number of cases is quite limited. But if, for instance, it really hits Syria and it really, um, then it would be a very horrible situation and hundreds of people could die because of the bad hospital, uh, the lack of doctors, the, the high number of vulnerable, pe uh, vulnerable people, and many NGOs, they have also warned for this in the UN, and they've called for, a, um, the UN have called for um, a nationwide ceasefire, but so far I haven't seen many uh, actors in Syria that they really, because Turkey still is complaining that the Kurds controlled areas, uh, the Russians are still complaining, the rebels hold areas. So I think so far there seems to be frozen conflict, uh, but there's always a big chance that there will be, again, a major conflict in, in the near future. But, for instance, I talked to a journalist in Kamishli, uh, and he was saying, well, we expect after the coronavirus pandemic is over, there could be a big war again. And uh, it's still unclear exactly what's going to happen, but people really fear that uh, the situation could, uh, yeah, it could 
again like explode again so people are not only afraid of of the coronavirus but they are also renew, uh fearing the new renewed conflict and also there are still bombings by by isis um attacks by isis uh because isis they are they were territorially defeated they lost all their territory in syria and iraq but they still are operating in both iraq and syria doing attacks kidnapping people because they there there were rumors that they were stepping up their operations and that they were regrouping yeah, what, I mean, what do you know about this? Well, I mean, the, some analysts they were talking about that that they are again strengthening their forces, uh, but ISIS was like really never defeated. Like well, before, they were defeated in Syria. They sent away several fighters to the desert basically to survive, and like for instance, in the especially the province of Derazor, there has been a lot of attacks, and now also in Iraq recently we saw more attacks. And I think it's also because security forces, because of the coronavirus, they cannot less freely move. And also the Americans, they are downgrading their presence in, in Iraq, for instance. So as a result of that, it's easier for ISIS to operate because without American support, for instance, Iraqis have difficulties fighting ISIS. Um, but that the Americans are basically downgrading their number of uh, forces in Iraq that's not related to the coronavirus. That's more related to Iran and, and U.S. tensions in Iraq. And have the Americans taken out their troops quicker because of the corona crisis or... Well, they have basically uh, repositioned their forces in, in bases in, in Baghdad and Erbil, and they have redone from several um, important bases inside central Iraq. Uh, but they are still there, and there are still tensions with, with Iran. So um, there's not only the issue of ISIS, but there's also the U.S.-Iran uh, dimension in Iraq. Because yeah. when I was still in Erbil, there were actually Iranian rockets coming towards Erbil. Uh, but luckily it didn't hit uh, anything, so there were no civilian casualties. But for instance, also Iranian rockets at that time hit a uh, US base um, in, uh, in Anbar, um, in the Ain al-Assad base. So there have been also still, there's still this fear of a renewed Iranian-US conflict also in Iraq. You don't sound very optimistic. <laughs> yeah, there's not so much to be optimistic over. And um, the tensions that were there before the coronavirus, they're still there. But at the same time, it's sort of a little bit more frozen now than before. Mm -hmm. And do, do you have any idea when you can when you can go back? I really have have no idea. Because of, what's the, how do you get nowadays to Erbil? Well, I mean, there are some Iraqis that returned from Europe to to uh, to Erbil and Baghdad because there are several uh, Iraqi students and Kurdish students studying in in UK, in Germany, and other countries. Um, so if uh, if Iraq allows the flight space to open again for commercial flights, it's, it's possible to go back. But so far there have been no commercial flights, but there have been some flights for people that are stuck. And also there's Dutch citizens recently that went back to the Netherlands. They had to pay a very expensive ticket, like $3,000 or something, to go back home. Uh, so it's very difficult now for journalists to cover uh, the Middle East, I think, because of this coronavirus, because there's no more flights. Uh, and that's why I think also the <coughs> tension is, is going down for uh, the problems in the Middle East and also in other countries in the world, because every country is focused on the coronavirus pandemic in their own country, but also there's no flights. Yeah. Um, we got a question, uh, Vladimir. Um, uh, it seems that the Kurdish authorities in their region of Syria uh, are well organized in their approach to uh, corona. How do you explain they are able to do this while they are under siege? Well, I mean, they have been organized quite uh, early from the beginning. They set up their own self-administration and they have de facto own government. And uh, despite that they're under siege and they have limited support, for instance, all the aid from the UN is going directly to the Syrian regime. Uh, they have been able basically to be very quite organized because they have like a, a, their own administration and also they don't have, for instance, the problems that the Turkish uh, back groups have because there's a lot of infighting sometimes in other areas. They don't have this problem of infighting. And they're quite well organized, but at the same time, they have many problems because recently they have... Um, Turkey sometimes is cutting off the water. Uh, and also uh, there was a decision by Russia. They did a veto and they closed off one of the main uh, border crossings from which UN aid was going to the northeast of Syria. So as a result, they have less medicine. Um, but the situation is still unclear because, I mean, there so far there has been only two to three coronavirus cases. But if that increases, we have to see what the capil uh, capabilities are uh, from the Kurdish-led administration. But so far they have been dealing quite quickly with the with the crisis because they are very quickly organized. And I also wrote a book about that. I have a book on the Syrian Kurds, which also deals with the um, basic formation of this administration in northeastern Syria. 
Um, I want to bring in uh, Shadul and Gilda. Uh, um, maybe you have any remarks for uh, for Vladimir or any questions? Different parts of the well, world. I have. I do have a short question. You were saying that um, it's difficult to send journalists there, uh, but what about? Syrian local journalists. And I, I think one of the reasons media has this problem is because it hasn't invested in local journalists and insists in, in flying in people uh, instead. I, I think had they really been serious about the diversity that they talk about, they would have worked with local journalists, they would maintain the relationship, and at situations like this, they would continue to stay informed. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a, a large number of local journalists working in Syria and northeastern Syria and other areas. They're quite well organized. There are some uh, local journalists working, for instance, for big news agencies like Reuters and AFP. But in general, the system of journalism, the international journalism, is to basically send foreign journalists to these regions. Uh, but, but there are still a number of local journalists. And if the international media is really interested in the situation in northeastern Syria, they always can get images uh, from inside Syria to this local journalist. So if there's really an, uh, more attention, but the problem is I think also the attention for foreign issues is, is people are, are, are basically tired of the Syrian conflict. Uh, they're tired of uh, all these years of, of talking about this conflict. So that's why I think the situation in Syria and also in Iraq, it's starting to be a little bit forgotten actually. Yeah. Gilda? Um, I have nothing to add, uh, but my big respect uh, for all these journalists acting in these very difficult times. And I agree that uh, one of the maybe main problems is that international press federations rely on sending their people to different countries instead of strengthening, uh, strengthening the diversity of local journalists inside the countries, and not only in the countries, but also regarding communities of interest, not only communities of countries, um, as is relevant uh, also for the Kurdish people, for example, and also uh, one similarity that we may have with the Romani people, and I'm also really looking forward to the topic of Rohingya coming today. I think this is something that these groups have in common in terms of media attention. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, switch to, to Gilda. Thanks a lot, uh, Vladimir. You're welcome. Um, yeah, and I hope you, you can return uh, quite soon. That's your aim, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will see if the things will open up again. Yeah. yeah. Um, welcome, Gilda. Uh, by the way, sorry, uh, we were a few minutes late, uh, as, you, uh, as you probably all uh, discovered, um, due to some technical issues, but uh, happy everyone is here. Um, Gilda, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, you are a, a journalist and an activist. You are a Roma yourself yes you live in vienna um how is it today in uh, in vienna well i guess uh, still vienna is one of the richest countries on the richest continent so i think we cannot compare any level of situation from a country like vienna um, also the government here reacted quite fast and quite strict um, and uh, the numbers are praised uh, regarding the corona development and I really have to say that uh, the figures coming from Italy which is our neighbor country uh, the figures coming uh, from UK were really shocking also our government and also uh, with um, the people that went away from our she tourism Ishkel Ishkel became a worldwide known name nobody knew what it is before except for millionaires but now everybody knows what Ishkel is actually branded as it's this uh, it's this ski resort machine. right yeah right so it became in a very negative way famous but i think that's uh, and very cynically spoken the biggest problem of austria or austrian citizens at the moment uh, compared to the situation that a lot of poorer communities also in europe face now hmm. um can you tell a little bit about the the, the work you do yourself uh, you're, a, you're a journalist, correct? I'm a journalist for nearly 15 years now. Uh, 10 years of it, I was working for the national broadcast ORF. 
um, while Austria is a comparably small country. Um, so I enlarged um, to international journalism as the Romani people, the Roma and Sinti are an international community. And in order to really um, do journalism on this group, you need to act international. And I'm a board member of the European Roma Arts and Culture Institute. Uh, since approximately one year now. So um, also uh, active as an activist, but also consulting, for example, projects and governments on the situation of Roma or Romani strategies, also regarding to media. So are, are you, is it correct if I'm saying that you, you're also advocating uh, the, the whole course of the Roma community in Eastern Europe? I think that's too much of an honor. I'm trying, uh, but organizations like the European Roma Rights Center, I think they have more impact than me. But thanks a lot. We are looking now at the uh, at, uh, interview you are doing on Rome blog. I see Gypsy TV. Uh, yeah. what, what, what is it exactly? Actually, Gypsy TV is one Romani organization existing since approximately nearly 20 years, active people. Uh, it's Romani people that came formerly from Serbia, and they started educating young Roma people in the means of media production, audio production, in order to form something like a strengthened lobby of Romani media, people who are able to use media. And the chief of it, Branislav Papunikolic, I'm greeting you. He's also my mentor and doing this far more than 20 years, uh, mainly without funding, uh, mainly without receiving any money for it. But uh, from this Gypsy TV and from Romblog, meanwhile, we can hundred young the use of media. Right. Hey, because um, if we talk about the Roma community, I think it's concentrated in Eastern Europe. But w which country has, where are most Romas, which different countries? Well, figures are, figures are never true regarding to Roma. We have the tradition after the Second World War that there is not a lot of statistic made about these communities. Actually, it's more than 30 different communities in Europe, so every figure uh, cannot be seen as serious. Um, but st official statistics say that the most Roma, approximately two and a half million, live in Romania. Uh, which is approximately 20% of the whole Romanian population. Right. So, um, if you take us into these communities, if you if you take us into uh, the, in, into these communities in these times of uh, of Corona, uh, what what are your observations? Well, my observation is that um, this situation um, is used. There is a gap at the moment. Uh, many people are many very focused to Corona and the fears around it. And suddenly a lot of, of far-right or conservative politicians test the new world far-dick rhetorics and polemics uh, on Roma. We also had a lot of violent attacks in different countries, and we saw propaganda media scapegoating Roma, for example, for spreading the coronavirus, but not only the wandering groups, also in the Slovakian settlements, where the Roma live completely segregated from the rest of the society. Not even a doctor is coming into the settlements, um, and they are scapegoated uh, as being uh, the ones who are spreading corona. And this is happening exactly in the countries where you might think about it as Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, uh, and Ukraine, for example, also a long time example. Um, because Gilda, so, Gilda, we look Looking now at some footage, I believe it's from Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, what What's happening there? This uh, video was made uh, more than one year ago for an EU conference. We wanted to show what's going on in terms of violence against Roma. This was a Romani village in the Ukraine that was raided, erased um, by, I don't know how to call it, but it was very radical, violent people. Um, and they were um, just burning the villages and, and um, people who didn't want it to leave, they were uh, simply 
well, they were violent against them. There was violence used and there was also people killed during this. Most important thing was that a lot of media didn't cover this and was not interested because the main videos documenting this violence came from mobile phones, from private persons. They were banned from Facebook. The distribution is very hard because there is no international Romani media lobby. And in the gatekeepers process, Romani news are often forgotten. So this is why at this very moment with people like journalists like Peter Yorna or Rachel Corona, who invited me also for today, um, we try to have a network of international Romani local journalists who work against disinformation. This is really a, a development uh, now because of Corona and the hate speech and disinformation that is rising everywhere, not only against Roma, for sure. Because you, you, I understood you, uh, you started like an educational program for, for journalists. Is, uh, what, can you t uh, tell us a little bit about this? Yes, um, it's a, I started, we started as an educational program for audio production, video production, storytelling, all digital communication and self-presentation <laughs> in order to make young Romani and Sinti people fit to act on the digital level as, as multiplicators, as voices, but also as journalists, actually. Um, and this is an, um, a work that we do now since approximately two and a half years. And um, meanwhile, there is some professional Romani media multiplicators in different countries. And at this moment, we try to connect them. If, if we look at the different countries in Eastern Europe, I mean, we saw that uh, that Orban basically, uh, well, he, he's, he's, uh, he has full power, it seems, almost. Uh, th there's a Roma community in Hungary as well. Does this affect them? I don't, what, what's the situation in Romania? Uh, um, this is the big problem. The Romani situation in the different countries is uh, rarely covered or not covered at all. We know since already years what's going on in Hungary with very restrictive um, rules that only belong to the Roma people. Um, and also in Romania, where even the military is used in general for the majority of society. We, in the last days, uh, I have a lot of private videos showing violence, physical violence against Romani people. I have seen a video of a seven-year-old child that was um, gepeached by politicians, hit by politicians. They lay this child down on the floor and then they hit a child lying on the floor um, during the corona controls. Um, and these kind of videos don't show up in the mainstream media. So this is why we try to interconnect share these videos and connect to our advocates like European Roma Rights Center and for sure also OSCE and UN. Because like in the Netherlands, we celebrated yesterday uh, 75 years of freedom, 75 years since the Second World War ended. Uh, we know that uh, a lot of, not only Jews, but also Roma and Sinti and, uh, got killed. So this, it sounds a little bit depressing, Gilda. Are we learning? Well, um, as a journalist, um, I would say no. As a human being, I would say I hope so. But yesterday, um, our uh, president of this country, Van der Bellen, went to a former concentration camp, uh, the biggest in Austria, which was Mauthausen. And he was, due to corona, standing there completely alone. There was not even one more person from our government to accompany him um, for this memorial. And I think whatever politicians say on certain days of remembrance, there has to be a political will for acting on each single every other day. And I, at the moment, I'm also concerned with the works of Chaya Stoika, which are very explicit. I hope you don't get censored for this. Um, this is uh, one painting of Chaya Stoika, Time Witness. Um, her exhibition was shown now in Madrid. And people who see the pictures of the suffering of the Second World War, of the Holocaust, um, they simply start to cry without knowing anything. The Holocaust is not only a trauma for Romani people or for Jews. This is 
uh, European trauma that no European country until now really had a therapy on. And I think if I look at people and talk to them about the Holocaust, they often feel very guilty. Uh, they shouldn't be guilty. They should feel responsibility for the future. Um, but still, this is a big trauma also in the majority society. And um, for me, I'm not optimistic about the political development, seeing the far right, the polemic um, rising and seeing hate as the main algorithm sharing line in social media. I think this is one of the main problems that we have at the moment. Uh, Gilda, I have a question from the audience. Um, uh, how do you perceive Roma life uh, under COVID-19 in terms of cultural expressions such as funerals? Uh, there are some examples from the Netherlands. These are quite a mix of classical performance combined with strict following the instructions. How is it in, uh, over there in the, in the communities? Well, in Austria, generally, we have strict rules. There was no um, such events uh, allowed until, I think, two weeks ago. And now, maximum 30 people can go there. Um, I think in terms of culture, I don't want to generalize. We have very different rituals um, in very different communities. And for sure, I think it's not a matter of culture that you want to join the last moment of a beloved person which died. I think the question is how the states in general coped with the topic of dying people and having dead people one over the other because they have no space where to give, where to, where to uh, begraben them, where to take them under. Uh, so I think I really don't want to narrow this question to the Romani community. This is really a strange situation for everybody. Um. I want to bring in Vladimir and uh, Shardul. Uh, maybe you you want to respond to uh, to Gilda, um, or any questions maybe for Gilda. There, there's also Roma communities in the Middle East, right, or in Turkey. Do you know anything about their situation, how it is there, or is it very comparable to Europe? Well, the situation in Turkey is a very own one in terms of politics. Um, I know that, and everybody knows that, Mr. Erdogan spent a lot of time to win the sympathies of the Romani communities uh, in Turkey. Uh, traditionally, the Romani people and the Kurdish people, they were like standing together like this in political matters. And since some years we have seen a trend, Erdogan really wants the Romani communities to like him. There was a lot of money invested into uh, ma making friendships with the Romani communities. Uh, I'm not there in a regional level, so I cannot tell how uh, successful this is. But at the moment, I also don't have any information about resistance movements. Um, I do have, uh, firstly, um, congratulations on what you're doing, because I think in all situations, uh, unless people are able to tell their own stories, they will always be misrepresented. Uh, I don't believe there is such a thing as morality in international politics. It's just self-interest. Um, so uh, what you're doing is exactly what needs to be done. I think local journalists, local writers need to be telling their stories and need to be representing themselves. So that's what we are doing in Bangladesh. And I'm very happy that you're doing that at your end. Uh, but I think also we need to be um, pragmatic. I mean, there is a lot of hypocrisy in this situation. People talk of democracy, people talk of freedom. But at the end of the day, it really is business as usual. Uh, and uh, I mean, you were mentioning the Rohingya situation. Uh, the, the reason a repressive government like mine can get away with doing what it does is because it takes care of Europe's uh, refugee problem by ensuring that the Rohingyas don't go on to uh, the shores of Europe or North America and stay within Bangladesh. They are uh, performing a very useful task as far as the international community is concerned. And as long as our government does that, they will turn a blind eye to the human rights abuses and all the other things that happen in my country and continue business as usual, continue supporting dictators and repressive regimes. 
because it suits their need. Um, so that's a typical story the world worldwide. Okay, Shaidul, this is Shaidul Alam. Um, thank you very much, Gilda. Please uh, stay uh, stay on. Um, uh, good evening for you, right, Shaidul? Um, very happy. Uh, yes. You can be on our program. Uh, as said, you're not only a photographer, you're a journalist, you're a writer, and you're an activist as well. And um, I think you you've been in uh, in custody in prison for quite a long time last year. You can you speak a little bit about this? What happened? You were just talking about your own regime. Um, yes, in fact, I was sitting exactly where I'm sitting now on the night of the 5th of August 2018. Uh, there had been massive protests across the country by students for road safety, and I was documenting it. On the 4th of August, uh, I got attacked uh, because the government, instead of uh, listening to what the students had to say, turned their armed thugs uh, to attack the students. And these thugs were being supported by the police. Of course, as a journalist, I was trying to report on it. I was doing live feeds. So I got attacked. My equipment got smashed. Uh, but I continued working. And the following day, uh, the 5th of August, um, I gave an interview to Al Jazeera in the afternoon. And at night, I was sitting exactly where I'm sitting now, uploading my material. Um, when the doorbell rang, I was alone in the flat. And when I opened the door, a large number of people, I'm not sure how many, plainclothes people came in. Uh, basically, they dragged me away, handcuffed me, blindfolded me, took me away. I was tortured that night. Uh, and after a long, massive international uh, campaign and a local campaign, and in fact, it was more dangerous for local people to protest because they're the ones who are more vulnerable. So, I uh, was on the sixth attempt given bail. So I'm now out on bail. The case still stands against me, and if I'm convicted, I still face 14 years in prison. And being accused of what? Uh, they were saying that I was instigating this, which is ridiculous, because as a journalist, I'm documenting it. I don't own a time machine. I, I can't be going backward in time to instigate it. But essentially, this is what happens to anyone who protests, uh, any dissenter of any form. Uh, yesterday, there were three people picked up um, by the security forces in one person's case. And this is a person we were working with trying to give out food to uh, hungry people in the streets. Uh, this person was, again, picked up by plain clothes people, and the government completely denied it. But today, they've just admitted that they have him in custody. So and, and he's exactly a, what happens. He's a journalist as well, or...? No, he's not a One is a cartoonist, one is a business person. This person was actually uh, a person who's involved in critical <clears throat> debates about current issues, but uh, our engagement with him was through uh, trying to distribute food to poor people. Because, uh, Shaidul, you're uh, quite well known uh, in Bangladesh, but also internationally. So as you said yourself, there was a lot of pressure on... Uh, on uh, on, uh, on your government to release you. Do you think you, you are out on bail because of, of the pressure or? I think it's a combination of things. Uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, my family and my friends uh, did not capitulate at any stage. Uh, they did not give in. And what usually happens is under these situations, I was in jail for over a hundred days after the initial period of torture, I was in jail. But uh, what happens under those situations is families beg forgiveness, they they make a deal. In my case, I was offered a deal. Uh, they, they said to me, we can let you go, everything's forgotten, provided you stay quiet. And often people accept these things. Uh, I wasn't prepared to do that. But the international pressure combined with the local pressure combined with the fact that there was so much public support uh, for what I and what we do, um, that it just got too hot to handle. Uh, I think they also thought that given the treatment I was given, once I came out, I would probably stay quiet. Of course, I've not done that. So now they, they don't really know uh, how to play this game. But of course, this is something that's been going on um, recently. Um, they also pick up soft targets. I mean, recently, uh, a contributor to the Rick News, a photojournalist, Shofi Islam, 
schedule. He was. Wait, we have uh, a small. Uh, we have a small video. Uh, you speaking. Let me. Let's have a look at it. Okay. That is why, generally, they end up in jail. I've been tortured in jail for over a hundred days for my reporting. I'm out, thanks to you. But many of my fellow journalists are still inside. Prisoners are squeezed together like sardines to accommodate many more than the facilities were designed for. When social distancing is essential, and with only one doctor per 10,000 prisoners, this is a catastrophe in the making. I appeal to my government and to global leaders in the interest of your nation to release all journalists detained for doing their duty. I appeal to all of you to keep up the pressure. Journalists belong outside, doing their job. Well, that's quite a strong appeal, uh, because it's also, it's talking about today, right? Because uh, what... The COVID-19 crisis, uh, how does it affect Bangladesh? How does it affect your work? You, I mean, you live in one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Yes, of course. But uh, as you pointed out, I, I don't only take pictures. I write, I podcast, I do online, online interviews on my human rights work. As a photographer, uh, at the moment, uh, I've been taking pictures of the monsoon storms. I've been taking pictures of uh, flowers uh, and things like that. But in fact, where I'm sitting now, you can actually hear people in the streets crying for food. Uh, this is what's happening. I mean, you've got a situation where you talk of lockdown, but for people who live day to day, uh, lockdown means hunger. Uh, and people who do not have a home cannot have home lockdown. So we should have had a situation where all the poor were taken care of so they could stay inside, so they could uh, keep the physical distance and they could um, look after themselves and look after the nation. But, you know, we, we have a ridiculous uh, situation where uh, I interviewed the principal of the Dhaka Medical College and he was telling me that he had a meeting with the health minister in December when they started planning uh, what to do regarding COVID. But uh, the particular, the perception of the average person is that uh, because the 100th birthday of the father of the nation was on the 17th of March, no bad news could be allowed to, it could be released before then. And predictably, the first reported death was on the 18th of March. So all that time, we were sitting on this lid doing a PR campaign while people were getting infected. Um, and now we've got a situation where, uh, you know, factories were closed, but then garment factory owner, uh, owners uh, at one point said to the workers that they needed to come back to work or they would lose their jobs. So yeah, because that, hundreds uh, and th because that that hundred that that trickled you. down here, right? That that the textile workers, that I believe even millions of people. Are they have have they been laid off? I mean, basically, who produced the clothes for much of uh, Europe and uh, and the US? Yeah, they give you your cheap clothes. Yes, uh, they don't get paid much themselves, but they give you cheap clothes. Um, but to come back to the story, yes, uh, what had happened was they were sent away, and they went back. Uh, then they were called with a threat that they would lose their jobs uh, if they didn't come. There was no public transport, so people walked hundreds of kilometers in some cases to try and get to uh, the factories. We spoke out, people generally spoke out about how this was unsafe, how uh, this was a catastrophe. And then pressurized, they send them back. So the same people started going back and both coming forward and coming back, they were stopped by the police on the way. So it was a, a, a comedy, uh, a very sad comedy really. Uh, now they've, they've come back again. Uh, again, a garment factory uh, worker was also picked up recently. So all of that is happening. And these, these are people who uh, are very poor people. They live in very concentrated situations. There is no question of them being able to live far away. They, you have eight, ten people crammed up in a room. They, they share a toilet. They, they have... Um, don't have running drinking water and things like that. So 
in those sort of situations. And I, I reported, I wrote in March that there was a famine about to come. And today, as we hear in the streets, that the number of people crying in the streets because they're hungry is ridiculous. And yet, uh, the main story that we hear is our ruling party politicians stealing the rice that's meant for the poor. Mm. But, but are the numbers reliable in, in Bangladesh? No, it's very, very difficult. Firstly, there have been very few tests in the first place. There was uh, um, a very credible organization called Gona Shasta Kendra who said that they had come up with a very cheap and practical, easy to use testing kit. But because there is so much vested interest of the pharmaceutical companies and one of the uh, advisors to the prime minister owns the biggest pharmaceutical, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the country. So they have a vested interest. So rather than the government going ahead and testing and approving uh, if it's okay, this, this kit, they've just sat on this thing and dragged their feet while people are dying. Mm. So we don't actually have the tests that can tell us how many people uh, are dying. And now what's happening is all these people who are being arrested are being arrested because they're whistleblowers. They're talking about doctors who talk about not having kits, uh, PPE kits in the hospital, about people dying, about unsafe conditions are being put in jail. Journalists who report about COVID-19 are being put in jail. And there is a general circular that's gone out to mainstream media saying you must not talk to mainstream media about COVID-19. Because you, you mentioned earlier, you you mentioned uh, Rohingya, right? The refugees yeah. uh, who are still in Bangladesh from from uh, from Myanmar, from over, uh, Burma. Over a million people in one of the most densely packed, uh, <coughs> certainly the biggest refugee camp in the world is here in Bangladesh. There, they don't have any of these facilities. Again, the stories are not being told. So, I'm very happy about the hearing about the Roma situation, we've also been training uh, Rohingya children to take pictures, to tell stories, so they can send out their stories. But right now, um, this uh, repressive regime is not prepared to let any story that goes against their propaganda machinery. So we might even see Rohingya people getting picked up and put in jail because they're telling the truth. But is, is anyone monitoring the situation? Any international you body? Can't. No, uh, access is uh, controlled by the government. And journalists today, I mean, we have one of the uh, very repressive um, law. That's the law I was arrested on, called, uh, which is uh, a, it's now called the Digital Security Act. So anyone who tries to do genuine reporting it will face the wrath of the government. You're only meant to say good things about the government. You can't critique anything. So, is there some optimism as well in the, in 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 the future of for you in, in your profession? I think uh, I mean we are in a very very difficult situation. The financial uh, situation is a meltdown. People, we, we are not able to pay salaries. Uh, we are not the only ones. There's many people like that, and that is not something that will go away very easily. Um, so, really, the government needs to be. Uh, I mean, you have these bailout packages in other countries. In my country, uh, that doesn't happen in the same way. What they've done is given cheap food, rice, and things like that, but that much of that rice seems to be stolen by the political elite anyway. But um, in answer to your question, yes, I do think there is hope, because today people, despite the repression, despite the disappearances and the extrajudicial killings, people are beginning to speak. Uh, and I don't think they'll be able to put the lid on this for very long. I think uh, people have their backs against the wall and they will come out in protest. Well, I'm happy we can end a little bit on a positive note. Um, but I do want to, uh, maybe Vladimir Gilda, you want to respond uh, or any questions to to uh, Shahidul? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Ladies first. Maybe you. <laughs> oh, thank. Thanks a lot. The Viennese first. Um, yeah, I, I wanted really to to first 
um, say that I'm very happy that there's journalists like you and many, many other out there thinking and acting like this. Um, and I'm quite shocked because after this conversation, I see that a lot of our journalists have to work against, behind or in between their own governments, um, which I think uh, is a big challenge. Um, maybe not yet in Central Europe, but with Hungary already too. Still, I have something optimistic. I see at this very moment in some political gaps uh, and in all countries, a higher probability to take risks, also in a positive way. Maybe this is the right moment to kick off really <laughs> progressive interconnections, progressive networks. For example, why the Rohingya journalists and the Romani are not connected yet. So this is the very right moment to do it. And we shouldn't wait for another Corona crisis to do it. Yeah, I actually had a question. There's many Bangladesh uh, people that I met in the Kurdistan region in Iraq. There's many Bangladeshis working outside of Bangladesh because of the bad economic situation in Bangladesh. How is the coronavirus actually affecting those people from Bangladesh that are, for instance, working in, in the Middle East to, to earn money? It's a very difficult situation for them because they're stranded out there. Uh, I mean, some have come back, but these are the people who, who produce the wealth that this government has. Uh, and they have been treated abominably. Uh, when they've come back, they've not been given the support because you know, many of these people have had to come back suddenly. They've not had a chance to repatriate their money or things like that. But really, that's what not being looked into. And the number of deaths in, of Bangladesh is within Bangladesh reportedly is low. But there's a very large number of Bangladeshis dying outside of Bangladesh. And uh, that's a major concern. I would like, while I'm speaking, also talk to Kadir, for instance, because I think one of the things you need to do is ask very hard questions of your own government. Because, uh, you know, for many of these governments, it's business as usual, and they will put up with a repressive regime they will continue trading as long as there is money to be made. Yet these are countries that talk about democracy, they talk about freedom, there's all this rhetoric. Yet it's completely hypocritical because at the end of the day, these colleagues of mine who are getting arrested, picked up, are completely isolated because there's no one speaking out for them. And our government is happy to say, well, no one, the international community doesn't complain, they don't question us. They don't uh, call out the fact, they don't say it was a rigged election. So we are fine. We must be doing a good job. And I think it is the culpability of the international community that is also against us. Yeah. Hey, uh, Shaidul, there, there was one, there's one question from the audience as well, which came in, uh, which is, uh, should there be more so-called amateur journalists to, uh, to solve the global problem about censorship? So there will be more. Well, there will be more information. Is that a certainly? There should be more citizen journalism. The word amateur comes from amor, which is about love, and I think everyone should be amateur. Even professionals should be amateur in that sense. They should love their profession. But certainly, there should be a lot more citizen journalism, particularly because mainstream media today is not doing its job. It's not allowed to do its job because the government is repressive. But I think they also succumb to. It being closer to the centers of power, being maybe picking up the crumbs, maybe uh, getting a few perks on the side. And government uh, has always done propaganda in every country. But today, private media is also sometimes, do, uh, in a lot of cases, doing government propaganda. There are important exceptions, but despite the ex exceptions, their mainstream media is not doing its job and people have lost trust. Therefore, it is social media that really needs to uh, get the media uh, information out. Uh, but of course, the problem is with social media, you also have um, no direct way of knowing how authentic it is. You have no way of verifying it. So, and I agree with what was being said. I need, think we need to build these solidarities. We build, need to build the networks internationally, but also within our country, so we can actually collectively have a voice. Definitely. Um, uh, Shaidul, um, please stay uh, safe. 
I want to thank you for your presence, uh, Gilda, as well, and uh, Vladimir. I really appreciate uh, your time and your insights um, to these different parts of the world and, um, and, and give your uh, very strong own visions and expressions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next week, uh, which will be May 13, um, we will have a next edition with uh, uh, another set of great guests, obviously. In the studio, we will have uh, Ruben Terlau, who is, uh, well, originally a film uh, photographer, but he became quite famous mm -hmm. in, uh, in Holland for the series, the different series he did on China. Uh, Lockdown in Holland uh, was working on a, on a new series on China, so he will speak about this. Uh, we will have uh, Diana Mukalet from uh, Lebanon, a journalist, uh, on the situation in Lebanon. And uh, we will have uh, Tasneem Al Sultan. Uh, she's a photographer, but also an Instagram almost star in, uh, from Saudi Arabia. So, um, Thank you very much and uh, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, hope to see you next week. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Bye-bye.